Welcome back everyone. My name is Eamon Courtney. I'm the founder of On The Yard Of and today's video is about the science of happiness. So let's talk about what's at stake. Science directs us to the path to happiness. But are you on it? That's the question because the mechanisms that can get us to happiness in both senses of the term are defined. So the path is clear. Whether you are on it or not is the question. And my courses are there to help guide you to the path if you're partially on it or if you're not on it at all or even if you're 80% of the way on it but not 100% that's what I'm here to help you do is get on the path to happiness and again if you want to hear way more about happiness go to ontheartof.com and watch the free workshop as I mentioned before by the end of this workshop you'll know the difference between happiness and fulfillment why each is important the biggest mistakes people make in their pursuit of each and exactly what you need to do to achieve both. Before we dive into the discussion about the science of happiness, I want to say something up front which is important and that is that in pop culture in recent years, happiness and wellness and well-being, all these terms have flooded in to the pop culture lexicon and because of that, there's a lot of clickbait out there. You know, there's a lot of bad advice, there's a lot of advice that's completely unfounded on, there's no data behind it. People are just writing things to kind of ride the wave of excitement and interest in the public sphere around these topics. Moreover, some things are just easier to study than others. So if you want to make an evidence-based case for something, you need to do some science. And science requires uh, isolating the variable under analysis. And that's just easier to do with some things than others. Let me give you an example. So with meditation, for example, you might see how meditation is pretty easy to isolate the variable under consideration. In general, right, you can take a big group of people and you divide them up, you know, a big group of people that have never meditated, you divide them up, you say, okay, this group, y'all just keep doing what you've been doing. You know, this other group, we're gonna teach you this amazing thing called meditation and you're gonna do it, you know, X minutes a day for X number of days and then we're gonna see how you're reporting, um, how you're feeling. So you could see how Things like meditation it's relatively easy you still have some considerations but it's relatively easy to like isolate the variable under consideration with something like marriage would marriage make me happy does marriage make people happy it is much harder because you have to isolate for all sorts of conditions pre-existing conditions because when you talk about marriage how people were raised matters whether or not they're active in the church matters there's all kinds of variables that get mixed up with the thing you're trying to study. And in popular culture, most people don't care to really do the due diligence and dig to see uh, if the study they're looking at or if the data they're looking at really um, considers these things. And for you, part of the value of having me walk you through all this stuff about happiness is that, you know, once upon a time, I was an engineer. I, I was a rocket scientist and I look at research with a very trained eye and what I'm trying to do is to save you all that time, all the time that I've invested in uh, really being diligent in researching these topics. I want to save you all that time and just give you the mechanisms that I know will help you change your life. So we can worry about expediting the change in your life rather than having to do all the research to get to that point. That's what I'm here for, to help you with. And if you've watched the previous videos, you know that when people talk about happiness, they're really talking about two different things. Again, language is an imprecise tool. We use the same word to mean different things. And when we talk about happiness, really there are two different discussions. The first discussion is around happiness in the psychological sense. And my course on the art of living happy is really devoted to that material. The other sense of the term is this values judgment we make about whether or not life is going well for us. We call this the well-being sense of the term. And my course on the art of living well delves into that material. I want to draw your attention to a very important distinction when we talk about these two different senses of the term of happiness. And that is when we talk about happiness in the psychological sense, we can be very prescriptive in terms of what we need to do, the mechanisms that will help us live happier and to exert control over our state of mind. And that is because we are all fundamentally human. We all have a body and a mind that shares a similar construction. You know, we all have a central nervous system uh, that looks very much like any other person's nervous system. And so we can do studies on big groups of people that are not us, you know, other people. We, should, we can do these studies on big swaths of people 
and look at the conclusions and then with high confidence apply those conclusions to our own lives. So the mechanisms that help us to exert control of our state of mind, to improve our mood, to live happier, in the psychological sense, we can take the learnings from other people and apply them with high confidence to ourselves. And when most people in the popular literature uh, or in, the, in kind of pop culture talk about the science of happiness, they are talking about this particular definition of happiness because this is where science can be very, very prescriptive. But when we talk about happiness in the well-being sense, living well, again, as I said before, we're really kind of talking about fulfillment. How to become fulfilled, how to say, yes, my life is going well for me, is a deeply personal endeavor. And therefore, the research is much more directional. Meaning science alone cannot point you to how you should actualize your talents. Uh, it can't tell you, oh, you should be a doctor and live in San Diego and be married and have no kids. Or you should be a writer and live in Paris and travel often and have two kids. It can't give you that level of specificity. What I can say with high confidence is that you have this unique gift inside of you. And no matter how much money you make, no matter how successful you are in the eyes of others, if you are not actualizing your unique potential, if you are not living a life true to yourself, you will never feel completely fulfilled. Now, I wanna give you an example to illustrate exactly what I mean. So this is an example from uh, my course, Living Happy. Uh, in the course, we talk a lot about meditation because meditation is an extraordinarily valuable tool or mechanism for us to exert control over our state of mind and improve our mood. What you see on the slide here is a randomized control trial by Niedich and colleagues of 298 university students that were randomly allocated to either a transcendental meditation program or a control group. So the meditation group was taught this form of meditation called transcendental meditation that anybody can learn. Uh, and they did it for three months, uh, 20 minutes, twice a day. Unless you really want to nerd out on statistics, don't really worry yourself too much about what the um, units are on the y-axis there. But what's important is just the uh, relative difference between the two bars there we see. So you see the lighter colored bar is the group that practiced transcendental meditation and the darker colored bar is the control group, those people that did not meditate during this three-month period. And what you see is very clear improvements in the group that meditated. So for total distress, anxiety, depression, anger, hostility, those bars, uh, a more negative value is good, meaning they decreased their their feelings of anxiety, depression, and anger and hostility, and then total distress over that period. So the decrease is good. It's a good thing that those bars are bigger in those four instances. And then you saw an increased, a reported increase in their coping ability uh, on that last bar there. So across the board, the group that meditated showed very clear improvements on these five measures. So great, so you read the study and that's exciting to you. You want to uh, repeat it. You want to replicate it. You want to learn Transcendental Meditation. It's quite prescriptive. I can tell you exactly what to do because I know exactly what these people did and we can sort of prescribe to you exactly what you need to do to, again, on average, achieve the same results. Very prescriptive, very clear mechanism of how to improve yourself in these ways. Now when we talk about living well, as I said, it's much less prescriptive and more directional. And I'm gonna show you what I mean in just a second. But to do that, I wanna introduce some terminology that you may or may not be familiar with. So um, I'm gonna introduce this idea of self-actualization, which we talk a lot about in the course Living Well, but in case you haven't taken the course or you're unfamiliar, I just wanna give you this sort of dictionary definition of self-actualization before we go further. What is self-actualization? Well, according to the dictionary, self-actualization is the realization or fulfillment of one's talents and potentialities, especially considered as a drive or need present in everyone. The central concepts of self-actualization have been around for centuries and debated across many different cultures. 
Now, though, we arrive in a time in history when we have the resources, where scientific inquiry has advanced to the place where we can actually test these ideas. In other words, now we are able to, uh, or we have ways of assessing how self-actualized people are, and then we can compare people at different ends of the spectrum uh, to each other across different measures related to happiness, wellness, etc. For example, there was a study done by Vasuda and Prasad in 2017 where they looked at 200 respondents and they were looking at specifically the relationships between self-actualization, narcissism, and happiness. And what they found was that higher levels of self-actualization led to lower levels of narcissism and that narcissism and happiness are negatively related to each other whereas self-actualization is positively related with happiness. Basically, we, we, we can see in the research that uh, self-actualization and happiness share a positive correlation. Great, I want to self-actualize. How do I do that? That is where we cannot be prescriptive the way that we can be when we talk about happiness in the psychological sense because what it is going to take for you is going to be different for me. So we have the same end goal but the, the means of getting there is going to be unique to each of us, which is why we have to go on this very personal journey to figure out what that's going to be. So when we ask questions like, how do I become fulfilled? What do I need to do to solve my existential crisis? The answer is not as clear as it is when we say things like, oh, how do I improve my mood? I've really struggled to, to figure out in my life what would make me fulfilled, what would solve my existential crisis. And through that struggle, I developed a lot of tools to help myself ask the right questions, to test assumptions that I had, to test hypotheses that I had. And the purpose of the course Living Well is to take all that work that I've done to assimilate it and to codify it into a structure for you to do that work on yourself, to ask yourself the right questions, to figure out the ways in which you can gather data about these different ideas that you have and and explore and, and find the answer on your own. So just to recap, when we talk about living happy, learning to exert control of our state of mind and improving our mood, this science gives us very specific mechanisms that can help us out. It can give us step-by-step -step guides of exactly what to do. Uh, in the example I gave here was meditation. When we talk about living well, Science can give us the, the thing that we should be striving for. It can tell us what we should be striving for, that is, to self-actualize. However, it cannot specifically tell us what to do because it's unique for each of us. And it's something also that society can't tell us, our parents can't tell us, nobody can tell us. The only person that can say what it is, is us. So we need to do the work to figure out what that is because the answer will not come from anywhere other than within. But the good news is, is that I have built a vessel for you to go on that journey yourself. Uh, my course, Living Well, is a course that will shepherd you along the journey uh, using exactly the same tools and frameworks that I have developed in the years of trying to figure out my own puzzle of what will make me fulfilled. And I know how powerful these tools have been for me, and I also know how powerful they've been for other students. So I feel very confident in what they can do for you too. In my next video, I'm gonna talk more about fulfillment and what makes it so tricky and so special to each of us. Also, before we go, just another reminder to check out the uh, free workshop on ontheartof.com uh, where you can hear much more about everything we talked about today. So check it out.